Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for MAFA Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at uh, La Clinica de la Raza for hosting today's session, Obesity, the Basics with Dr. Margot Hudson. Dr. Hudson is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, where she has practiced for nearly 40 years, specializing in endocrinology. She's interested in the medical treatment of obesity, as well as thyroid problems and osteoporosis. And we're just so very thankful to have her as a Maven Project volunteer. So Dr. Hudson, when you're ready, please begin. Okay, thank you, thank you, Kristen. Um, and uh, as she said, this is gonna be a talk about obesity, the basics. And let me just figure out how to advance the slides. Um, so um, this is my disclosure. I have no disclosures. The only disclosure I was telling Kristen, I'm sitting outside because it's a beautiful day and the, my cleaning surface is gonna be coming any minute. Um, but my neighborhood, uh, the, the neighbor's dog has been running into my yard. So hopefully he won't make an appearance during the talk. Okay. So these are the objectives for uh, the talk. First, um, I hope that you will understand the epidemiology and a little bit about some theories on causation of obesity. Then I will move to understanding, uh, talking to you about understanding the medical consequences of obesity. And finally, we'll discuss um, treatment approaches, uh, including lifestyle modification, medication, and surgery. So, and it, I think it's important to understand how obesity is defined. Generally, um, most people will use BMI, which is just a measure of height and weight. So this is limited because it really doesn't take into account muscle mass or uh, fat mass. And you can imagine that uh, the um, uh, some of the track and field people who were on the Olympics team might have a very high BMI, but a very low fat mass, for example. Uh, the other thing about uh, the ranges I have listed here is they're not adjusted for Asian ethnicity uh, and uh, for people uh, who are Asian, generally uh, these classifications occur at lower BMI. So first, uh, normal or underweight, uh, BMIs below 24.9. Uh, overweight is anything over 24. Five and here in this uh, category, they call it pre obese. I usually just say overweight 25 to 29.9. And then we have our three classes of obesity class one, 30 to 34.9, class two, 35 to 39, and class three, greater than 40. And this is important because some insurances require different BMIs in order for the patient to qualify for various treatments. So this uh, just gives you a, a bit of an idea of epidemiology of obesity over the years in the U.S. And uh, you can see that our country is turning from a blue, blue states to red states. Um, and in the context of obesity, um, if you look down here, you'll see that uh, in 1990, all the states uh, had no more than 19% uh, um, of the population being uh, obese. Uh, by 2020, you can see down here in the corner, um, there was a significant increase in uh, obesity with up to 24% of the population being obese. And now here, especially marked in the South, uh, we have many areas where more than 30% of the population is obese. This shows you a little bit about obesity uh, by age and sex. This is a little bit newer data. And you can see that uh, very high percentages in men and women of obesity, uh, Patients who are younger, uh, meaning uh, under 40, have the lowest rates of obesity. And then as we age, those rates go up and women tend to be uh, uh, have higher BMIs than men. So um, you can see this is, you know, we're in the 40% uh, category for population currently that's obese. 
Um, so there are many theories as to what causes obesity. Uh, one, we know that genetics has an important um, impact on obesity and over 250 genes uh, have currently been identified to contribute to weight and they're finding new ones all the time. Um, if you look at um, this uh, graph here, uh, you can see that um, genes, they're talking about how much uh, uh, is the uh, weight determined by the genes. And for people who are normal weight, uh, only about 30% uh, of our weight is determined by genes, meaning um, activity level, uh, um, uh, diet, et cetera, account for a lot of the variants. Um, but for the extremely obese, and I think this is important when we're trying to treat patients, for the extremely obese patients, up to 80% of their weight is determined by uh, their genetic loading. Um, and I think that when you think about that and how to counsel people, um, I, I think that will give you a lot more sympathy for people who, who really have a genetic disease. So another theory beyond genes is uh, our food choices. And of course, our genes don't change over 20 or 30 years, but, um, but we are getting more obese. So, so one question is, is it what we eat? And this is looking at a very popular theory about um, sweeteners added to our food. And you can see that total um, uh, carbohydrate or uh, sugar uh, intake uh, started to increase in the 80s and has gone up um, uh, into uh, the present time. And that um, does, is not reflected by an increase in cane or beet sugars. They actually, actually, the intake of those has gone down. But where we see a big increase has been in the use of high fructose corn syrup as the sweetener of choice uh, in many foods and um, whether that is contributing to uh, higher um, intake of sugars and higher obesity rates has been postulated. But again, these are all theories. And the other theory that I really wanna talk about because I think it's kind of fascinating um, is the whole idea of gut microbiome. So what does that even mean? The gut microbiome really is uh, all the bacteria that are in your GI system. Uh, we have bacteria in the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, so we know, one thing that we know is that obesity is so associated with less diversity in the types of bacteria. So there are fewer types of bacteria, not fewer numbers of bacteria, but fewer types of bacteria. So that's known. Um, What's postulated is that may lead to leaky gut and an increase in inflammation. We know that obesity is associated with increase in inflammation. Um, and it's also postulated that perhaps short-chain fatty acids uh, leak out of the gut in obesity and um, higher levels of these lead to various hormonal changes, which uh, may, again, promote um, uh, obesity. So. This is a theory, but um, I think it's interesting and we'll have to see if it ever gets proven. But let's move on to the consequences of obesity because of course, as clinicians, this is what we're concerned about. Um, and uh, obesity really causes tremendous numbers of problems medically um, from, a, uh, and, and quite, diverse. I mean, we all think about heart disease, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, but I think we don't always uh, think about pulmonary disease such as sleep apnea. Um, uh, now we're all learning a lot more about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or more currently named metabolic associated uh, fatty liver disease. Um, gallbladder disease, gallstones, uh, gynecologic problems, including polycystic ovaries, osteoarthritis, of course, that's, that's clear. Um, 
breast cancer and uterine cancer are much more common in obese women. Um, I mentioned uh, all the cardiovascular complications and then uh, stroke, cataracts, and uh, this kind of oddball thing about it, increased uh, intracranial hypertension um, or pseudotumor cerebri being associated with obesity. So uh, do all these problems um, affect uh, longevity? And the answer is definitely. Uh, and you can see these are uh, tables from a large study. Um, the, and I'm showing you just uh, in men and in women who never smoke, because uh, obviously smokers would have a very different mortality um, curve. So this is based on the BMI of these people and when they were 50 years old and what happened to them over the next 10 years of follow-up, okay? So you can see that as BMI went up above 24 to 25 in men, there is really a rapid rise in risk of death. Um, so that when you get to the highest, it's almost three times higher than for those people who are below 25. And it's interesting that at the low end, uh, we also see an uptick and that may be because some of these people have other problems like um, malignancies that would contribute to uh, their uh, early mortality. And we see a very similar curve in women. So um, this uh, shows you a little bit about specific illnesses and um, how much higher the uh, risk is uh, depending on how obese the patients are. So for, for people who are overweight, the 25 to 29.9 range, um, uh, they have uh, for diabetes, of course, we know they're, they have a 60% higher risk of uh, diabetes. But I think when you look at class two and class three obesity, it's just, I mean, to me, unbelievable that they have seven times, class three obesity has seven times higher the risk of uh, diabetes um, compared to people with a normal weight. Um, and we see this at class two and class three obesity, these tremendous increases in hypertension, uh, cholesterol, increased cholesterol, asthma, and arthritis. So really um, a very marked um, effect on uh, various medical problems and uh, increasing uh, risk with increasing degrees of obesity. So when you're counseling a patient, they're going to want to know how much weight do I need to lose to get some benefit, right? They want to know. And um, I think it's very hard for patients to imagine getting to a normal weight if they're starting out as obese. And I think, you know, realistically, um, it's that's true. So instead of thinking you have to get to normal weight, I think you should think about um, percentage loss of their current weight. So how much of your current weight do you need to lose um, in order to get benefit? Uh, and as I said, the weight doesn't need to get to normal. It just needs to be lower. So we definitely see benefits with just 5% weight loss in blood pressure, lipids, hepatic steatosis, and A1C. And I didn't actually put this in the slide, but just to mention um, uh, weight loss of 10% almost completely eliminates uh, hepatic steatosis. Um, and then in obese patients with diabetes, 10% or more weight loss with calorie restriction. Uh, this was the look ahead study, reduced cardiovascular mortality by 21%. So that's mortality. Um, so I think you can tell uh, patients, obese patients uh, with diabetes that uh, weight loss is going to affect longevity. And this is some uh, data from the diabetes prevention trial, uh, which was uh, the very large American study looking at patients with prediabetes and various interventions um, uh, and risk of uh, converting from prediabetes to diabetes. So 
what you can see here is that for patients who didn't lose anything uh, when they were in the trial, who didn't lose anything, their risk for they recruited very high risk patients, their risk of developing diabetes was basically about 12% per year, um, 12 to 14%. So very, very high. If they lost just five kilograms, that went down to about 5%. And here, if they lost uh, 10 to 15 kilograms, their risk of um, uh, progressing to diabetes uh, was almost zero. So um, very effective at preventing diabetes. And just to point out, this is not percents. This uh, study was reported in just absolute amount of loss by kilograms. So um, once the patients are convinced that they should lose weight, uh, we would like to counsel them, of course, on um, how to do that. And so most uh, lifestyle programs use the diabetes prevention program. That's the study I just talked about to prevent going, progressing from prediabetes to diabetes. So and what did they do in that study? They aimed for 7% uh, weight loss. Obviously, more weight loss would be great, um, but uh, you're trying to get the patient to aim for about 7% weight loss. And how would they do that? Uh, 500 calorie deficit from their usual diet. So there's no magic here. People generally need to eat less. It's just a matter of strategies. Um, and that 500 calorie deficit was combined with an exercise program of 150 minutes per week of moderate to intense exercise. And just uh, to let you know, so what was involved when they actually did the trial, the diabetes prevention trial, if people didn't show up to the gym, they sent a taxi cab to their house and they brought them to the gym. Now, obviously we cannot um, do that as clinicians, but um, that's how important it was for them to get exercise. So first let's focus on diet. Is there a best diet to um, achieve this uh, calorie deficit? And here is a study uh, done a little while ago, you can see 2009, but I think it was a very well done study. They randomized 800 overweight adults. So these were people with BMIs between 25 and 40. And they aimed to have their uh, calorie deficit to be about 750 calories a day from their usual diet. This uh, did not uh, really emphasize exercise as much as some of the other programs. This was exercise only aiming for 90 minutes a week. Um, and they looked at four diets, high carb diet, low fat, high protein diet, high fat, average protein, and high fat, high protein. So um, some of these are kind of ketotic, the high fat average protein would be a, a ketotic diet, for example, um, low fat, higher protein would be like a Mediterranean diet. And what they found was no difference between all these different uh, macronutrient strategies, no differences at 24 months. And I think, you know, it's a little bit of a busy slide. I, you know, each of these is the four different groups. And these are just the error bars, so forget the lines. But you can see initially at six months, all four groups lost uh, about six kilograms from baseline. And then over 24 months, they actually unfortunately started uh, to regain the weight. And uh, that is a very common problem with diets, that there is weight regain. Now, this is a uh, somewhat newer study, and um, it had slightly different results in terms of looking at macronutrient mix. So they randomized smaller number, 120 obese patients. So these had higher BMIs um, and they looked at just at 12 months and they compared a low carb diet, which is uh, 40 grams per day uh, versus a low fat diet, which is 30%, less than 30% of the calories as fat. Um, and they found the low carb diet had uh, better HDL and total cholesterol. Um, and you can see they also found that at 12 months, weight loss was better in this study in the low carb diet. So um, uh, 
they initially lost about uh, 5.7 kilograms compared to 2.6. And then you can see there is weight regain, although less weight regain in the low carb diet than the low fat. So maybe low carb diets are a little bit better. There are a lot of studies out there and they can have variable results, but I wanted to show you um, two studies uh, and what they came up with. So this is kind of the newest thing I think in terms of uh, diet is timed fasting. Um, and uh, trying to look into this, I found basically three different strategies. So one there is what we usually recommend, which is just daily energy restriction. So um, most diets are aiming for 500 to 750 calories, and the patient does that seven days a week. Then there is something called intermittent fasting. This seems to be very popular where people go on a very low calorie diet, so less than 800 total calories a day, two days a week, and have their usual diet five days a week. And then there is time-restricted eating, where you eat all the calories uh, in a time-limited frame, so over several hours in a day uh, to eliminate nighttime snacking and in various other um, uh, types of eating. So there have been several studies comparing these strategies. Um, they're all kind of limited, but um, in most studies, the strategies seem equally effective. And I just wanted to show you one study um, here published uh, recently in New England Journal, and they looked at uh, diet control with calorie restriction only versus a diet with time and calorie restriction. And you can see they followed, you know, these are relatively small studies. Um, they followed the patients over a 12 month period uh, and there was uh, equal weight loss in both groups. The time restricted um, diet did not seem to offer any advantage in this study. So what about delving a little bit more into exercise and recommendations? So um, there's no evidence to favor one type or intensity of exercise over another. All exercise is beneficial, um, uh, as I mentioned, to just maintain weight after weight loss. Um, you should counsel people to keep from having that um, uh, uh, bounce back in weight, um, 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise or 75 to 150 minutes a week of high intensity exercise. So if they're using weight, uh, if they're using exercise as a strategy to maintain their weight, um, it's a big commitment. And if they want to continue to lose weight, um, this is an even bigger commitment. So um, I think we need to be honest when we talk to our patients about how much exercise really needs to be done. Uh, it isn't just doing 10,000 steps a day, although 10,000 steps is good, but it's not going to help them lose weight. So again, you can see here 250 minutes a week of moderate or 150 minutes of high intensity exercise plus resistance training on at least two non-consecutive days a week. So big, big commitment for most patients. Hard, hard to hard to get them to do that. So what about medications? Which patients might benefit from weight loss medications? So um, just coming from the American Diabetes Association standards of care, uh, uh, patients with a BMI of 27 or higher who have a comorbidity like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia uh, should be considered. Any patient whose BMI is greater than uh, 30 who has tried intensive lifestyle without success, which I must say is most people, uh, and the patient is motivated to lose weight. So those are people you should consider weight loss medication for. Um, here are... Uh, here is a, a like a rogue gallery here, failed drugs for weight loss. You can see many drugs, fenfluramine. Uh, many of you were probably not even born when fenfen -fen was around. I certainly remember um, 
it as a very uh, effective combination, but uh, cause significant cardiac problems. And uh, then uh, sabutramine and lorcasserin have both recently been taken off the market for uh, significant um, potential uh, for um, uh, side effects and bad outcomes. So these are the currently approved uh, medications. So Fentermin, which is the fen of fen, fen used alone can result in about 5% weight loss, um, significant uh, side effects, um, uh, and in patients with poorly controlled hypertension or heart problems, not a good choice. Uh, and you can see dosing here for Fentermin. Um, Fentermin combined with topiramate is more effective, uh, up to 9% weight loss. Um, and certainly I've used this combination with success. Um, the uh, topiramate can cause significant uh, cognitive um, issues that people complain about. Uh, it can be used. You don't have to use. It comes uh, as a brand uh, combination, but um, both these drugs are available um, generically and the prescriptions can be written for the generic form. Um, Orlistat, I believe, is available over the counter, very minimal weight loss. Um, and then uh, the other combination drug is naltrexone bupropion, again, with very modest weight loss when you're considering it also as the combination, very expensive. So now we get to kind of the newest thing. Um, and uh, so those are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And I don't know if you're aware of what that even means, but hopefully I'm gonna try and explain what, uh, what that means. So you first have to understand what are the incretin hormones. So the incretin hormones here are uh, GIP, which is used to be gastric inhibitory peptide, but now is glucose-dependent um, insulin secretagogue peptide that's uh, produced in the duodenum. And GLP, glucagon-like peptide 1, produced uh, in the jejunum. And when you eat something um, that causes an increase in glucose, but it also causes these uh, hormones to be released independent of a rise or before the rise in glucose. And the pancreas, of course, secretes insulin uh, in response to a rise in glucose. But when these hormones are present, the pancreas uh, is kind of revved up and will produce uh, additional uh, insulin over what the level of glucose uh, normally would cause. So this is a way of getting the um, whole system geared up for um, an increase in glucose from your food. Now, these hormones, hopefully I haven't lost you yet, but these hormones circulate in the blood and they have very short half-life and they are broken down by DPP-4, which is an enzyme which breaks them down. And um, just as an aside, we're not talking about this, but there are drugs called DPP-4 inhibitors such as citagliptin, and they um, inhibit DPP-4 so that there is longer uh, duration of uh, circulating time of these two hormones, but it really doesn't do all that much. It certainly doesn't do as much as giving an analog, a long-acting analog. So GLP-1, the naturally secreted hormone, does more than just uh, cause insulin secretion. It decreases gastric emptying. Um, it uh, decreases uh, glucagon production. Um, uh, it uh, helps improve hepatic glucose production. It decreases appetite and it has cardioprotective effects. But again, the naturally secreted hormone is limited because it has short circulating uh, half-life. Uh, half so a GLP-1 receptor agonist is a peptide uh, created in a lab that will bind to the GLP-1 receptor um, uh, 
will bind to the GLP-1 receptor and uh, will have prolonged effect and a greater effect because we can give bigger doses than could ever possibly be naturally produced. Um, so it will do GLP-1 receptor agonists will do all the same things. Um, they actually help decrease inflammation. They help uh, with cardiac function. They decrease gastric emptying, increase insulin, decrease glucagon, perhaps protect beta cells. Um, they help with hepatic steatosis. Uh, and, you know, the big thing for our talk is appetite and obesity, and they're very good for decreasing appetite, which results in weight loss. So just to get the kind of more complicated, what about dual agonists? I think you've all heard that there are, that uh, trizepatide is a dual agonist. Well, what does that mean? So it does all, it binds to the GLP-1 receptor, okay, just like uh, the other drugs that are available. And it does all those good things, especially with weight loss. But it also binds to the GIP receptor and gives added effect, which gives added weight loss. So trizepatide is like taking two drugs in one because it has two uh, receptors that it will bind to. So what are the GLP-1 receptor agonists that are currently approved for obesity? So there's liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 receptor only. Uh, maximum dose for weight loss is three milligrams a day. It's a daily injection. Uh, it can cause up to about 6% weight loss. And the starting dose is 0.6 milligrams daily. Uh, semaglutide is also GLP-1 receptor agonist only. Uh, 2.4 milligram uh, weekly dose. It causes greater weight loss than liraglutide, 9.6%, starting dose 0.25 milligrams weekly. And finally, trizepatide, which I mentioned is a GLP-1 and a GIP receptor agonist, maximum dose 15 milligrams, much more weight loss, 14.7%, starting dose 2.5 milligrams weekly. And this just gives you an idea. I mean, it's a little bit unfair because they only uh, uh, did it, um, tested terzepatide against um, half dose of semaglutide, but you can see uh, 13 in this study, 13% weight loss uh, in patients, uh, 12 over 12 kilograms of weight loss um, at the maximum dose. And that's out to 40 weeks so that you don't see this kind of leveling off. I mean, it doesn't go on forever. People do level off, but um, uh, it is uh, tremendously effective. So uh, what about uh, improved cardiovascular outcomes? That's a big issue. Um, for uh, patients with obesity, um, do these? How do these drugs do? So uh, the first trial that looked at cardiovascular outcomes was with liraglutide. This was done in patients with diabetes. They had a composite uh, cardiovascular outcomes, thirteen percent. You can see that here that uh, there was a thirteen percent overall improvement, and actually death from any cause. 15% uh, improvement in mortality. This was in patients with diabetes only. And then you have cardiovascular outcomes in obesity without diabetes, uh, looking at semaglutide. Uh, this uh, study here you can see showed a 20% decrease in cardiovascular events and an 18% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. So this helped uh, semaglutide, this study, get um, approved for weight loss. So, but what about body composition? I said BMI is not the be all end all because it doesn't really tell you whether you're losing fat mass or lean mass. And of course we don't want patients to lose muscle mass. So with semaglutide uh, on average fat loss, uh, 3.4 kilograms compared to 2.4 of lean mass. So um, more fat loss than um, uh, muscle mass loss, but um, 
it, it's not a huge amount more uh, compared to terzepatide, which actually showed 30% fat mass loss compared to only 10% uh, in lean mass. So less effect on muscle. We don't want the patients losing muscle mass. So let me turn now to the option of bariatric, um, currently better known as metabolic surgery. So there are three um, procedures. Uh, Ruin Y causes the most weight loss, but also the most post-op complications, including malabsorption. Gastric sleeve currently is the most commonly performed procedure, uh, certainly at least in my hospital. Uh, I don't know locally if you have experience with this or if the surgeons are doing gastric sleeves. And gastric banding is the least effective and it's actually rarely done. And the general indications, uh, BMI of over 30 with a comorbidity such as diabetes or BMI over 35 for pretty much anyone else. Again, I don't know in your various locations whether insurance coverage for bariatric surgery will follow these guidelines or not. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of what these procedures actually are. So banding, really, you can see it's putting a rubber band around uh, the uh, top of the stomach uh, to limit the pouch um, so that patients uh, are limited in what they can eat. It's very restrictive. Gastric bypass really kind of reroutes the whole GI tract. Um, it splits the stomach, but it does not remove the stomach. Um, and then it has the stomach empty into the distal small bowel. Um, and that's what causes the malabsorption. So the food does not go through the duodenum. Gastric sleeve really just cuts off half uh, the stomach. And, um, uh, but the actual, uh, 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 duodenum and the GI tract is intact. So how do these uh, affect weight? So this uh, gives a longitudinal study of 4,000 obese patients. Um, and they looked at all the different procedures. So obese patients uh, you can see this is over 15 years. Their weight was relatively stable. Um, all three of the um, surgical procedures resulted in significant weight loss in one year. Then there is weight regain. This is a big problem. And you can see it in banding and in sleeve. This vertical banded gastroscopy is really a sleeve. Um, uh, and the best weight loss with gastric bypass, um, the least weight regain, but as I said, uh, the most post-op complications. So what about mortality? How does bariatric surgery compare to uh, semaglutide, for example? So here, mortality, 24% better. Um, so that is pretty impressive as far as a mortality benefit. Um, so surgery definitely works. This gives you an idea of body composition after bariatric surgery. Um, as a small study, uh, this is similar to terzepatide fat mass loss, 34%, lean uh, muscle mass loss, 12%. Um, and you can see here, this is just showing you where the fat mass. So this is in the trunk. This is in the legs. This is in the arms. And this is in the visceral adipose tissue um, compared to uh, where muscle mass is lost. So greatest muscle mass lost in the arms, for example. So um, this is interesting. Can one molecule bind to three receptors and what will that do? So there is, um, you know, um, new molecule being tested 
here is its name, that it is a triple agonist. So we have our GIP, it's a uh, GIP receptor agonist, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, but they also add, and this was very counterintuitive, glucagon receptor agonist. So nobody would believe that activating glucagon um, or act, activating the glucagon receptor would help. Um, but when they tried it, they got uh, tremendous uh, changes in weight. This is not kilograms, this is percentage weight loss. At the highest doses, people were losing 23, 24% of their weight. Um, so again, and uh, this, um, this has a lot of promise. Uh, it is um, still in testing, not yes, yet released. So we have to kind of see what happens there. So um, just in the last few minutes here, I thought um, I would go over a few cases and questions, not so much for, we can, we can open it up to chatting, but just to, to think about uh, some of the things I said. So um, you are meeting a 30-year-old male for the first time. He has a history of obesity since adolescence. He has tried many diets and failed to maintain weight loss. He is on no medications. Uh, on physical exam, BMI is 33, blood pressure 130 over 80, mild acanthosis, normal fat distribution, fasting blood sugar 92, lipid profile is normal. He wants to know why should he make the effort to lose weight, okay? It's like... Why should this young guy make an effort? So what do you think you would tell him? Uh, because he doesn't have hypertension or diabetes, he doesn't need to worry about increased risk of heart disease. Obesity is genetically determined, so he won't be able to lose weight. He is at higher risk of liver disease and arthritis because of obesity. Uh, high fructose foods are a healthy alternative to high fat foods. So you can kind of think about that. So I thought what we should tell him is that he is at higher risk of liver disease and arthritis because of obesity. Uh, he's all He also is over time at higher risk for cardiovascular outcomes. So um, uh, I do think that we should counsel people who are obese to try and... Um, uh, get their uh, BMI down if at all possible. Question two. So now you convince him that he should try and lose weight and he wants to know which diet to follow and you tell him low fat is superior to low carb, Mediterranean is superior to other strategies, high protein is superior to other strategies, or time-restricted diet doesn't add benefits over calorie restriction. So I think time-restricted diet doesn't add benefits. I don't know, maybe some of you have had different experience with that. And finally, your next patient has a BMI of 40 and is concerned about the higher mortality of obese patients. He wants to know if any randomized trial have shown uh, benefit of weight loss and in which types of patients. Uh, which of the following has shown mortality benefit um, obese patients treated with GLP meds, gastric bypass surgery, type 2 diabetes patients treated with lifestyle who achieve 10% weight loss. So I think there's pretty good evidence that um, uh, all of these are true and would be options for this patient. So in summary, the incidence of obesity is increasing. Uh, obesity appears to be caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Obesity contributes to many serious health problems. The best diet and dietary strategy hasn't been determined. There are many that you can try. And weight loss drugs are achieving results comparable to bariatric surgery. So uh, at this point, I can leave it open for questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Hudson. This was fantastic. I don't see any questions yet. So don't worry, I'll stall. Please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box, the chat box, use the um, raised hand feature and you can speak directly to Dr. Hudson. Just a reminder, when you click out of this uh, CME survey, no, when you click out of this webinar, the CME survey will appear in a tab on your browser. Um, make sure that you have the correct date, September 12th. Correct speaker, Dr. Margo Hudson. Uh, we do appreciate all of your feedback. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. If you think of a question after the fact, please feel free to um, reach out to Dr. Hudson or any of our Maven Project volunteers in the community portal. And while I'm still stalling, just to, um, kind of doing a plea, if you will, but we're looking for. Um, clinic providers that would be interested. So anybody attending um, that would be interested in creating a quick video to just kind of highlight the impact that you've received, um, the impact of Maven Project to your practice. So to ensure that we keep our programs affordable for our clinics um, and, and we can continue to expand our services. Um, you know, I have huge ideas for CME that you would get CME for more than just the live webinars. But to be able to do that, we need to share the real impact of Maven Project with our donors. So stories from clinicians who use Maven Project services are incredibly powerful. If you're interested in doing this, um, you can click, I'm gonna put this link in the chat and we would really just love to hear from you. If you have any questions about it, email me. I, um, I'll get you to the right person if I can't answer the question. Now I've talked for three minutes, so I don't see any questions. Um, oh, yes I do, just kidding. How long do you keep folks on meds? Is there an upper limit? Can they be used as chronic meds for folks who experience re rebound upon discontinuation? So I would say for patients who lose weight on meds, if they stop the meds, they will regain the weight. There is no persistent effect. So there's always weight regain if you stop the meds. Now, in terms of how long patients can be on, as far as we know, patients can be on uh, any of the GLP-1 receptor agonists forever. Um, there doesn't seem to be time limits. Fentermin alone always kind of had a time limit thing, you know, used for three months and then go off. Um, I always found that when patients went off, if they were using Fentermin, I didn't really talk much about using Fentermin or who to use it in, but that they would always regain the weight. So um, I think, again, Fentermin, Fentermin plus topiramate, those were the primary things I was using um, uh, with or without a GLP that they are on for the duration. If they become pregnant uh, or are anticipating pregnancy, then they do have to discontinue all these weight loss drugs, none of them are approved for use in pregnancy. Um, but otherwise, yes, the only thing that is kind of a one and done is uh, bariatric surgery where you have it and then you're done. Um, the, uh, the drugs uh, have no lasting effect. I don't know if they, that answered entirely the question. But a good so. question. It's a good question because this is like when you're getting started, and you're trying to counsel somebody um, and they're struggling with a chronic disease, you have to point out this is a chronic disease. People don't think about going on blood pressure medicines, getting their blood pressure under control and stopping them. You know, they don't think about going on cholesterol lowering medications, getting their cholesterol at goal and then stopping the drug. Nobody thinks about those treatment strategies that way. But with obesity, we're always thinking, let's get the weight down and then you can get off the medications. And I just don't see that. I, I don't want to be too much on my soapbox here about this, but I just don't see that there's any hope of success in that kind of a strategy. So the patients need to be committed to being on this until we come up with something better. I mean, there may be something, you know, more permanent that's a one and done in the future, but right now only bariatric surgery kind of meets that. Good to know. 
Um, do you know of the age range as in minimum and maximum for metabolic surgery? Oh, so um, I think that would really depend a little bit on the different centers. Uh, I mean, even some pediatric cases are having metabolic surgery. So I would say, um, and depending on the uh, how bad the obesity is, you know, how high the BMI is, uh, anywhere from uh, you know, age 15, 16 up. Um, and then once you start getting um, above 70, 75, the patient really needs to, you know, think about what their goals are, what are they hoping to achieve. Um, I think for people with really bad sleep apnea and just uh, not able to lose weight on drugs, it would be something to consider at any age, as long as they were surgical candidates otherwise. So, so I, I, I think it's a wide age range, um, but in the pediatric, it, it would really depend on the different centers um, and what they were uh, used to doing. Thanks. Um, there has been an emphasis on the psychological role in weight management as in behavioral modification. Can you talk about this? Um, well, there's it's a huge psychological role, of course. And I think uh, this is where working with a nutritionist is very helpful uh, in terms of helping the patient understand their behaviors and various strategies for improving it. So I'm, I like definitely think uh, behavior modification and working with the therapist will be helpful because if they don't change their eating habits, they're not going to be successful. So, so people need to kind of understand um, and recognize what their patterns are, what their triggers are. There are a lot of triggers for eating. And uh, the more a patient understands their personal triggers, I think the more successful they may be with lifestyle, you know. Um, and, and even the medications. I mean, uh, if they don't have that piece of it under control, they will not be successful. So I'm, I definitely am all, all for it. Yeah. Thank you. No, it is a challenge to change eating habits, <laughs> but um, I don't see any more questions. But I think this was great. Dr. Hudson, thank you so much for putting this together and presenting today. And thank you all for joining us.